And then I started fooling around with this typewriter, and I, I thought, damn, I fell for it. So I knew there was a directional transmitter in there, and I had to find it. It was a transmitter, homemade transmitter. Uh, all uh, these transistors and batteries and uh, antennas and things, all in notches carved out of a very thin piece of plywood. This was a murder plot. It was a plot to make me disappear, mm -hmm. and that the, French, uh, the Spanish services were going to do the job. This was brought on by Henry Kissinger, who Secretary, Secretary of State then made this long trip over there, I mean this secret trip over there, and uh, forced the British to take action against me and started a whole series of deportations. Philip A.G. quit the CIA after 12 years. The CIA desperately tried to prevent his writing of a book. We'll hear his story in the concluding hour of our two-part series of our interview with him right now on Alternative Views. Phil was in the CIA for 12 years and then quit after he saw what the CIA was actually doing, all the terrible things doing in the areas where he was working particularly in Ecuador, Mexico, and Uruguay. He resigned in 1969 to write his first big book, Inside the Company, or CIA Diary. Since then, he's written uh, five books, the last one being On the Run, which tells about his experiences after he got out of the CIA, when he was in Europe and trying to write his book, and the CIA was hounding him from country to country, doing everything it could to uh, keep him from writing this book. W would, would you mind, you, I'm sure you told this story hundreds of thousands of times before, you could tell us your famous typewriter story about... Uh, sure, I'm glad to. Uh, <laughs> I hope we have enough tape for it, because yeah. uh, it's a la long story, but I'll try to make it short, just the bare bones. Well, that's okay, that's okay, uh, we have lots of tape. Oh, all right. <laughs> Well, what happens is this. I, um, uh, just to set the scene, I had left the CIA in, um, at the end of 1968. had turned against the work, but I hadn't any intention of writing a book or doing anything. I wanted to start a new life, and among the things I did was to re-enroll in university. I stayed living in Mexico City, where I'd worked on the Olympics, and I went into a doctoral program in Latin American Studies at the National Autonomous University there in Mexico City, the huge one. And as I plowed through these studies, uh, month after month, doing the reading, doing the writing of the papers and so forth. I, and I was studying, you know, the horrors of the conquest and the genocide of the colonial period, the forced labor and all of that, the, 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 the wiping out of an entire culture. And then the United States domination in the post-colonial period. I was thinking and thinking and I, I came to the conclusion that what I and my colleagues were doing was nothing more than a continuation of all this. It started at that time nearly 500 years earlier. And um, that led me to think um, that maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to expose what we were doing. It had been an unthinkable idea until then. Nobody had ever done it. And I was pledged to secrecy, but I began to think that maybe staying silent uh, on all this was um, worse than, than doing it, you know. In fact, I could see some very positive things in, in a, a book. And so I <clears throat> began looking around Mexico City for uh, resources. I needed to reconstruct events to show our hand in events, and um, I couldn't find them in Mexico City, so I, I had to choose. And I chose for the book, came to Europe, and um, spent a year in France. And um, I made a mistake early on. I wrote a letter to the leading Latin American, or certainly South American, political weekly called Marcha at that time. And um, it's published in Montevideo. 
And I had, uh, uh, I had mentioned how we intervened in elections because they had elections coming up, and uh, I was hoping to, um, to um, uh, aid the Frente Amplio uh, with this letter, which they did publish, and I didn't know they'd published it. And so one night in Paris, they knock on the door in my hotel, and there is an old friend from the CIA. And um, we go out and have a few drinks, and he says, Phil, uh, I guess you know that um, I'm here for a reason. And I said, well, I, yeah, I think you are. What is it? <laughs> and then he, he takes out this thing, he puts it on the paper, and says, Xerox copy of my article, which was published in this, mag this uh, newspaper, or, or weekly, in uh, Uruguay, Marcha. And he said, Mr. Helms wants to know about this, because I'd mentioned it, that I was writing a book. He was the head of the CIA. He was director then. And he sent this Keith over to see me. And uh, anyway, uh, I said, don't worry, I'm not going to reveal any secrets. I'm going to submit it for um, review and all of that. You know, I, <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to get him off my back. Well, anyway, I, uh, my, my children were visiting. It was over Christmas and New Year's of, of that year, um, 71, 72. And uh, so I took them and uh, in the wee hours of the morning went over to the railway station and got a ticket and we went to Spain, got out of there. And um, then eventually they flew back to the States to go back to school from Madrid and I went back to Spain. Uh, to Paris. But um, a few months later, a young American befriended me, a fellow whose name was Sal Ferreira. And he was a journalist, or he said he was a journalist, an underground journalist who was representing a couple of groups in the States. And he was over in Paris to cover the peace talks then going on between Le Docteau of Vietnam and Henry Kissinger. Uh, we saw each other from time to time. I was living in a very cheap hotel on the West Bank, just down from the Sorbonne, and on the corner there was a cafe called Le Yam. And um, he came in there, and that's where he met me. I'd go down there in the evenings for a beer or something. And, uh, so I was desperate for money. I was really, um, I didn't know how I could continue working on my book because I, had, I, I was running out of money. I had no money, in fact, to, to speak of, just enough for a, a little food every day, and I was getting desperate. And I had rented a typewriter. Um, from a, a typewriter shop at uh, Odeon. And uh, eventually I had to turn that typewriter back in to get the deposit back. In the meantime, I had taken a big chance. I had told Sal who I was and what I was doing, hoping he might do an interview he could sell to Playboy for $10,000 and give me five, you know. And so he was, uh, he was recording the, all the stuff on, on about the CIA and the book I was working on. Uh, it was my only hope to get some money, and he did give me money, as a matter of fact. Um, you know, a little bit here and a little bit there just to keep me going. And one time he invited me to dinner the next week. Oh, by the way, uh, when I was with him, uh, I'd noticed surveillance in the street. Oh. And I was being followed around uh, from about February of 1972 on. And the first time that happened, that night I went off, uh, very late at night, I checked out of the hotel and made sure nobody was there and took a taxi over to the area where a friend of mine lived, a woman whose name was Catherine in the Passy section of uh, Paris. And I, um, I uh, asked her if I could stay in her place for a few days. It turned out to be six months or more because um, uh, I, I had to stay in secret. And so I wouldn't tell anybody where I was living. I wouldn't tell Sal or anybody else. Anyway, he invites me to dinner. We go to dinner and he says, we're walking up the um, hill there um, to, um, to um, uh, Room of Todd. And uh, he points out this English style pub he said, let's have a beer there afterwards. They've got English beer in there. I said, fine. So we went to dinner, came back, went into the pub, and there's a bar here, and there's a stool here, stool here, stool here, and so forth, and these are empty, and he sits on the one on the end. I sit on the one next to him. We order our beer, and in comes this rather attractive, voluptuous, young American woman, or woman, let's say, carrying a Time magazine, so you can tell she was American. <laughs> and uh, so she starts to talk to me, and she is a Venezuelan heiress. Uh, I mean, an American, but had r been raised in Venezuela, and her parents had died and left her a lot of money. And she had just spent the academic year over in Geneva at the University of Geneva studying French. Um, and she was going to spend the summer in Paris. So uh, uh, she wanted to know what I was doing, and I said, well, I'm, I'm trying to write a book. And uh, she said, oh, the great American novel. And I said, not exactly. Um, <laughs> I said, it's about American foreign policy in Latin America. And she says, oh, oh, isn't that awful? Awful. And I said, it's partly about the CIA, too. And she said, oh, oh, awful. I can't stand those people. It's <laughs> terrible. And so anyway, we talk a little bit. And uh, she says, well, look, call me. Uh, call me. I'll invite you to dinner. And so she writes out her telephone number and gives it to me. So I'm thinking, well, what is this going to lead to? And uh, I, um, I didn't call her. And uh, I left, went on through my routine not to be followed back to, uh, to the little, little room where I was staying. And... Um, about a week later, I see Sal, 
and to do some more of this recording for the interview. He was notoriously slow on that, which made me very suspicious. Mm -hmm. And um, he brings up this woman. He said, by the way, did Leslie, she used the name Leslie Gun Dunnigan. Did Leslie, um, did you call Leslie and uh, did you talk to her and see her? And I said, no, no, Sal, I'm not interested. I'm not interested. Here, you take the telephone uh, <laughs> number and you call her. He said, no, no, but remember, she's got money. She's, uh, she's an heiress and, and maybe you could talk her into, um, into, into um, supporting you and, and financing your book. I said, well, Sal, maybe, maybe, maybe I should talk to her. <laughs> so, so what I did was I, I called her. And she said, oh, hello, how are you? Yes. Well, yeah, let's have dinner. Uh, come on over and I'll take you to dinner. So she lived down in Montparnasse on Rue Pitard. I went over to her place. It was this big, tall, modern building. I went up to the uh, studio she had rented. And so we'd sit around talking, have a drink or something. Then she takes me out to dinner. It's a very romantic place with <laughs> red and white che checkered tablecloths and, 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 and candles and everything. And have our steak frites and... Then we go back to her place, and uh, we're sitting there talking, maybe um, having another drink, a little wine or something, I guess. And uh, it was either that time or the next time that I decided to tell her who I was and see if I get some money out of her. So I did. And she said, oh, yes, yes, I'll do that. I'll help you. I'll help you. But, you know, I can't stay in Paris. It's too boring. I'll leave you this apartment, uh, this studio apartment, for the summer. You can have the key, and here's a... I've forgotten how many thousands of francs she gave me. And um, I'm going off to see my boyfriend in uh, Barcelona, and we're going to Mallorca for the summer. So, I have the apartment, I have the money, and all I needed was some help because I had to get a clean draft of what I had done so far ready for Barney Rossett of Grove Press who was coming through Paris on the way from the Frankfurt Book Fair back to the States in October. So, uh, there was another person who I'd met in this cafe, Yams, a French-Canadian whose name was Therese. And she was doing secretarial work. Uh, she had raised her children in the United States. She had married an American. They were divorced. She had a son and a daughter she used to talk about all the time. And we had a lot of political con conversations. She was very, very hip politically. So I asked her if she would... Uh, oh, as a matter of fact, I asked somebody else first, but that's another story. The woman freaked out and, and, and had a nervous breakdown when I told her who I was and <laughs> what I was doing. Her st eyeballs started rolling around in her head. And, oh, God. I, I had to, she had to go to the American Hospital in Paris. But, um, then I said, well, okay, I'll ask Therese. <laughs> So I asked her, she said, sure, I'll help you, I'll help you. I'll come over there in the evenings. Um, we'll do it in the evenings after, um, after I get off work, because she was working in a law firm over there at that time. So I gave her the address and keys and everything, and I would go over and wait for her, and she'd get there about 7.30 or 8. And this was Leslie's apartment. And you can guess the end of the story, naturally. Leslie was working with the CIA the whole time, and they were recording everything Therese and I were saying in this apartment. But uh, anyway, we used the apartment. She got the whole thing done. And Leslie then comes back from Mallorca in September. And uh, she and Sal kind of team up together. And um, uh, they're giving me money still. She's giving me money. And then I finish what I'm doing in Paris. I'm going to go over to uh, London to finish because the British Museum Newspaper Library, this fantastic institution, has newspapers from all times and all places. And they had all the local papers from the places where I'd worked in the CIA, from the times I was working there. And so I could go over there and read all the newspapers that I was reading, you know, when I was there. And that's what made my book, by the way, because everything we did uh, of importance came out in the newspapers, um, save our hand in these events. But that's jumping ahead a little bit. What happens is this. Um, I had this borrowed typewriter from Sal, which I was using, and one night Leslie comes in in the rain to a place where we were going to meet. It was a, it was a cafe in the, uh, on the West Bank, and uh, she comes in with this typewriter. Uh, it's a used typewriter, and she said, Phil, uh, the guy who owns that typewriter that Sal gave you is back, and he needs it back immediately. But here's one that I bought for you from a used typewriter store. And so I said, oh, fine. And I, uh, I had to go back and get that other typewriter from Katrine's room, you know, and bring it back over because the guy had to have it. So I, inst I didn't want to carry this one. I didn't need a typewriter. I was making recordings then for, um, for London. And these were operational episodes, maybe 40 or 50 secret operations, which I was trying to describe on tape uh, to use over in London. And so I, um, I didn't need the typewriter. I put it in Therese's uh, uh, apartment. Uh, she always left the door open. She wasn't there. I just stuck it in there to, to have it out of the way. And then I went back to get the other typewriter, brought it back, gave it to Leslie. And then a few days later, uh, uh, we're at lunch, and Leslie has given me the money that I need to get over to London and last for a couple of weeks before they come over, supposedly, to help me continue working on the book and doing the research. And uh, Sal says, uh, uh, over lunch, he says, by the way, Phil, did, uh, how's the typewriter that Leslie gave you working? 
And I said, well, Sal, I, um, I haven't used it l l yet. I didn't need it. I'm doing recordings right now, and I left it in Therese's place. Well, I got the money, but later on I was talking to Sal. He says, Phil, you know, Leslie's so upset about the typewriter. She had that terrible cold, and she went out in the rain and got that typewriter for you. And, you know, we all know Therese never locks her apartment. She's already had her radio and other stuff stolen from there. And if you're th the typewriter is stolen, Leslie's going to be so upset. And she's already so hurt. Um, uh, 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 uh. She might not continue financing. <laughs> <laughs> so I took the typewriter, and I took it over to Katrine's place. And it was there for a few days before I was ready to go to London. And on a Saturday afternoon, I'd finished the tapes, went out to get a beer, came back up the steps, and this was a this building was where the servants lived, to a very elegant building uh, in the 16th arrondissement, which is the se richest area of Paris. And so it was a small maid's room where Catherine and I, where I was staying with her. And so I w came up the steps, went down this dark, ha dark hallway, and there in front of her door, I saw these two people, a man and a woman, standing at the door as if they'd just knocked. But as I approached down this dark hallway, they backed off from the door over to the other side of the hallway and began to embrace and to kiss, it seemed, it looked like. And they had coats on. It was already, I think, um, uh, the end of October, early November. And um, so I stopped at her door and knocked, and she opened the door. And, um, and she started to laugh at the people over there. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I think, I think they're monitors or something. I think the CIA has caught me. I think they've caught me. I went in, closed the door, and the reason I thought that was that Katrina used to like to listen to the radio. It was a Phillips table model recorder uh, thing uh, with radio and FM and all that. And for the last days, uh, when she was listening to it, there was this beeping sound on the radio. And um, I, I thought it was uh, propagation from ORTF, which is the radio television center in Paris, and we were so close there. Um, but um, it was a, a kind of an irritating thing. It was like beep, 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 like that. And um, uh, as I was standing there, and these people were embracing, and I was waiting for her to open the door, I was hearing the beeping sound, and I thought, my God, that sound. We hadn't even t spoken about it. But I was thinking, it's so loud now, it's coming all the way out in the hallway. When she opened the door, I noticed the radio was off. Oh. And so I said, listen, I was hearing a beeping sound from, that I was hearing on the radio, but I was hearing it out in the hallway, the radio was off. She said, yeah, the guy's got a hearing aid in his ear. <laughs> and they've got those bulky things under their coats. And so... Um, uh, so uh, I went in there and I said, I'm going to try to find out what's in there because they found me now. And she said, well, I'll follow them. And so they went down the steps and she was after them. But they forgot that it's on the middle level, like on the third floor level or so, because this building is built on the bank going down to the Seine. And it doesn't have a street in front of it. It has this passage. It's a walkway that goes down. And so they went all the, way to, all the way to the bottom where the garbage cans are kept for everybody in the building. And there's a door there, but you have to have a key to get in or out of that door. And they were trying the door and trying, they couldn't, she told me that when she came back up. She went over and fiddled around with some garbage cans and just watched them and they whispered some things and they went back up and out and disappeared. She came back to me the story. And then I started fooling around with this typewriter and I, I thought, damn, I fell for it. And I turned on the radio and you could get this signal at several frequencies, but there was one that was really loud or strong. And so I began to turn the... I, I thought that they had DF'd some kind of transmitter, you know. Direction, that's how they... Direction finding. That's right. Yeah. And that's how they could find the box, which is where they found me. And so I began to turn the typewriter around slowly like this, and uh, depending upon the axis of the, of the box that held the typewriter, the signal was louder or softer. Uh -huh. So I knew there was a directional transmitter in there, yeah. and I had to find it. I thought first it might be in the roller or wherever, but then I started checking the inside of the roof of the box, and I pulled off the, the um, upholstery. And there, before my eyes, was this most ama ama amazing thing. It was a transmitter, homemade transmitter. Uh, all. Uh, these transistors and batteries and uh, antennas and things all in notches carved out of a very thin piece of plywood that wasn't even a half an, maybe quarter inch plywood or something and it was an amazing sight to see and I um, of course realized and um, then I, um, I had to get rid of a lot of papers the next day and I, I went out on the Seine and there was a little beach there where I took a whole suitcase full of papers to make a bonfire uh, because I, it was too much to tear up and, and all that. So I made this bonfire out there, and I'm, 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 it's blazing and everything. And, and um, it was just uh, down the river from the Eiffel Tower, and you could see it right over there. And I, one time I looked up, and there was this guy with a camera, 
with a, a handheld camera, a motion efficient camera, and he was supposedly filming the Eiffel Tower, but I think he was filming me doing this bonfire <laughs> with all these papers. And so I kind of freaked at that. But anyway, the, the, um, the um, result was that I left her place. And I went over to Montmartre on the other side of Paris. And I changed hotels for the rest of the days I was there, maybe three or four days, because it takes one day for those slips to catch up with the police. The, the, the registry, registry oh, slips oh, that you oh, have yeah. to fill out in the hotels in Paris. And so I was changing hotels, staying one day ahead of the uh, CIA and the French police, and then I took the boat over to, um, uh, took the train up to Calais and across to, um, to um, Folkestone. And on the boat they were waiting for me, the British immigration, and when I got up there they said, oh yes, uh, uh, take a seat over there, Mr. A.G., uh, and uh, we'll call you. And so time went by and I had all these tapes on me and uh, I had all the work that I'd done in Paris in a year and before that in Mexico and I, I thought what is going to happen and I, the tapes were very incriminating and I thought they might just take them away from me um, and so it was raining like hell um, on the crossing it was quite rough and everything but I went up in that rain on the top deck I threw the tapes all my tapes over because I didn't want them caught oh. or anybody to see them so that was gone. And uh, then they called me back to the desk and said, uh, where are you staying? Well, I had uh, this old uh, copy of Europe on $5 a day that everybody <laughs> yeah, used at that time. Now it's Europe on $100 a day, yeah. I suppose. But uh, it, was it was the cheapest places to live. <laughs> and so I had chosen uh, some better breakfast by Argyle Square uh, near, near the stations, St. Pancras and uh, King's Cross. And I gave them a wrong address also taken, but it was a little bit more expensive than this cheapest place. So I lied to them and went on from the train uh, to this place and checked in this bed and breakfast and this was the most depressing area. Oh God, it was awful over Christmas of uh, 1972 because it was foggy and cold and rainy and they had these yellow uh, street lights uh, in London in this section. It was all old red brick buildings and ugly and it was a far cry from Café au lait and yeah. Croissant in Paris every morning. But anyway, I continued on the book. I, I got uh, the money from Penguin Books, and that solved the problem. Then I just went on and did the book. And in the meantime, the day I left Paris to come to London, um, uh, Therese was arrested. And I learned this on the telephone because I'd made telephone arrangements to speak with Sal and, uh, and Leslie after I got to London because they were coming over. I talked to Sal. And uh, he says, oh, everything terrible has happened. You can't imagine. They picked up Therese and they took her into the prefecture and they talked to her all day about you, interrogating her, wanting to know this and wanting to know that. And Leslie got so scared with this that she went down to Madrid. I said, why to Madrid? She's got to come over here. She's got the money. He said, well, I'm going down there too. You're too hot right now. We've got to, we've got to all go down to uh, Spain. Uh, and so then they, they, he goes down to join her there and we're on the phone all the time. They're calling me now because the British pay telephones could be called from outside. You know, they would ring it, so we'd mm -hmm. make a plan, and I'd go there and stand by the phone until it rang. And, and so they went down to Malaga, and they did everything they could do to get me to go to, to um, Spain. And I, of course, was on to, I mean, I, mean yeah. I knew, even though I'd had doubts before, now I had proof. And so I wouldn't go. But I said, send me the money, and I'll, I'll go in an indirect way so I don't have to go through airport passport controls and things like that. I'll take train, I'll take buses, things like that. And they wouldn't do it. Wouldn't <laughs> it. I said, no, I'll come, I'll come. I was naturally going to just keep the money. Yeah. wasn't going to go by any means to, to Spain. At that time, it was Franco, Franco it was <laughs> yeah. fascism. I knew the CIA was thick as thieves with the fascist um, security services. I knew that from my own experience. And so I wasn't going to go. But in the meantime, I got relief from Penguin Books, and that changed my whole life. I was able to go on and do the book. Leslie disappeared, and Sal went back to Paris, and they didn't come over. And um, then I wrote the book, it came out, and after the book had come out, maybe a year or so afterwards, I was in Geneva, and um, I happened to meet someone who said, uh, oh, Mr. A.J., I'm Ecuadorian, you know, and I've read your book, and it is fabulous. Uh, everybody in Ecuador is um, up in arms about it. And uh, we knew all the names that were in there. and. Um, by the way, I think I know that Leslie Donegan that was working against you in Paris. This is years afterwards, you know. This is like uh, from 72 to 76 or 77. 76 probably. And uh, I said, what do you mean? He says, well, I think she's working at the United Nations right now. But she uses a different name. Here she calls herself Janet Strickland. I said, well, how do you know she's the same person? Well, my best friend is a Spanish guy who works for the UN here too. And his best friend is a Spanish guy, and she told 
her boyfriend, who's a Spanish guy, that she was working for the CIA against you. And he told my friend, and my friend told me. And I said, well, um, I wonder if we can see her. He said, oh, yeah, I know where her office is. He was working for one UN agency. She was working for the ILO, the International Labor Organization. And so we drove over to the um, ILO building, parked in the basement. I sat in the cafe while he went up to see if she was in her office. And she was in the office. He came back down. So I went up the elevator, ninth floor or so, walked down the hallway around the corner. And I looked different then because when I was in Paris and she was working on this thing, uh, I had very long hair. I had a huge um, Zapata-style mustache. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I was look pretty creepy looking. <laughs> but by this time, I cut my hair and it was, yeah. I was normal. And uh, so I just walked down that hallway, looked in very carefully and walked on, and it was, it was she. And so I went on back down, got with him. And then I was back in Paris, and I wrote up the story. And uh, I took it to René Bachmann, uh, an editor at Nouvel Observateur, which is the sort of Time Newsweek of France, a uh, guy I knew. And uh, he said he, he loved the story, and they wanted to publish it. And uh, here the CIA person was now working under another name in the UN, no less. So he said, what about photographs? I said, what do you mean photographs? I don't have any photographs of her. Uh, you can get some photographs of her, maybe. Um, no, no, you and her together, you and she together. I said, you mean uh, 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 confrontation? He said, yeah. I've got two photographers over there who are great people. They could do something marvelous. We'd have really good photographs. I said, Rene, uh, if you'll pay my way over there and pay the hotel, I'll do it. Or I'll try to do it. So, back to Geneva. I go to see Danny uh, Gignou, who is the f photographer, a woman, and her f friend Hans, who's also a photographer. They're working together. And so we make our plan. And the plan included... Um, going down after after this thing in her office if we could do it then we would not go to the elevator but d we thought there'd be a fuss so we would go down we would get find the stairway and we knew where it was and we would go down four or five flights real fast and then go over to the elevator and down and out and you know we had the car in there. so we got it all ready and the night before in the hotel i practiced uh, in my bathroom mirror the uh, most ferocious looks i could put on my face <laughs> because i wanted to scare her really scare this you know what out of her and um, so uh, the next morning, we got in the car. They had all their equipment over to the ILO, parked the car in the basement, up the elevator to her floor, down the hallway and around the corner, and the door is closed where it had been open before. I said, oh, my God, she's not working today. I knocked on the door, come in. And so I open the door and walk in and start walking over to her desk, which was on the other side by the windows. Danny goes over here to this corner. Hans closes the door behind him and stands in front of the door. And I walk over to her, and I'm leaning over on her de desk like this, and I'm saying, hello, Leslie. Using the old name. Yeah. You thought I'd never find you, did you? <laughs> I said, well, I found you, and now I'm going to get you. You could have gotten me killed back then, and now I'm going to get you. <laughs> and, and she let out this primal scream you can't imagine. She got up, she went over to the door, and we had this fabulous photo taken by Danny, where she's, uh, she's really big, she was tall. Tall, maybe in those heels she was over six feet. And so she's grabbing him by the arm to pull him away from the door, and she's screaming all the time. She opens the door and goes running down the hallway screaming at the top of her voice. We hustle out to the stairwell, down, down to the car, and out back to the studio, got the photographs. Um, uh, they came out perfect. Oh. They were great. And so back on the flight, uh, plane to uh, Paris, give it all to Rene, and it's coming out on Thursday about four days later. Thursday, I go to the newsstand by the magazine, and where's the story? It's not in there. Oh. And I call Rennie. I said, Rennie, what the hell is this? And uh, he said, oh, Phil, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, John Doniel has killed the story. And John Doniel was the chief editor. He happened to be the man that Kennedy had sent to see Fidel in November of 63, and he was uh, about improving relations. And he was sitting in Fidel's office when Fidel got the first word of Kennedy's assassination. And John, Don John Doniel had told Rene, well, we're not in the bus business of exposing CIA operations. And so uh, it was dead. And uh, I didn't do anything until uh, more on the story until uh, November when my deportation crisis started in Britain. And um, this was brought on by Henry Kissinger, who Secret Secretary of State then made this long trip over there. I mean, this secret trip over there and uh, forced the British to take action against me and started a whole series of deportations. But the Sun newspaper in London, I mean, all the media descended on me in Cambridge. And the Sun wanted their special angle. You know, they're the third page nude, nude every day, uh, the, the mass tabloid newspaper of 
sells four million, five million copies a day. And uh, so they wanted some kind of sex angle, and uh, I thought, well, <laughs> I'll give you a story. And so I gave them the Leslie Janet story. And um, darn if they didn't find Leslie Dunnigan. They got their New York bureau onto it, and they uh, found Leslie Dunnigan, a motel clerk in Georgia. And she swore that she'd never worked for the CIA, never worked against me, had never even been to Europe. And so it was obviously a, 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 a false lead. The last question was, have you ever heard of a Janet Strickland? Oh, sure. She was my best friend. We grew up in Crocus together. Oh, so she switched names. She, Janet Strickland apparently was the real name, and she t took her friend's identity. <laughs> and so then they found the family. They were in an enormous villa in Palm Beach. And Leslie Janet was there. And it was her parents' place, and her father turns out to be the head of all the Exxon operations in Latin America. Um. And the photographer and the journalist go down there, and the fa father comes down and threatens to punch the, you know, the, the photographer, and they got, he got a picture. And, and so the son then ran a three-part series on this. Um, the spy who, well, I've forgotten now what that headline was, but it was front-page stuff, you know. Um, and that's the story. And I don't know where she is now. Uh, Sal disappeared. Gosh. And the, the circle was complete. I told you it was a long story. <laughs> the circle was complete. The uh, uh, oil man's daughter was yeah. working for the CIA. Incredible, incredible. incredible. But in any case, um, uh, I have right now a, a lawsuit going in the federal district court in Washington under the Federal Tort Claims Act for $6 million because we found in documentation that I received under the FOIA in a long-running lawsuit from late 70s to early 80s that the... CIA had committed criminal actions against me during that period in which I was in contact with Sal and Leslie, uh, early 70s. And the documents are highly censored, so we didn't get the exact nature of this. But um, it happened that the CIA tried to get a criminal indictment against me when my first book first came out. This is early 75, and Colby was the director. And they had to back down because the Justice Department, who, which was getting the facts to take to the grand jury, told, found, uh, uh, discovered all this illegal, illegal activity in the files. And they told the CIA, if we indict and prosecute, then AG is going to have access to all this through criminal discovery procedure. They said, no, no, I can never see the light of day. And five times in the 70s, starting in 75, including when George Bush was director, they tried to get an indictment against me, and five times they backed down because this was so sensitive. And I think it's going to come out now in my torts claim, act, uh, torts claim lawsuit that this was a murder plot. It was a plot to make me disappear mm -hmm. and that the, Fritz, uh, the Spanish services were going to do the job uh, if they could get me to go to Spain. That is Sal and Leslie. Not that they knew what was really going to happen. Their job was to get me in Spain, and then the Spanish would take over. And there was nothing to them to you know, dis disappear somebody yeah. in those period. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we will get the real, all the facts out well, and, uh, and find out what they really were planning. That's ironic. You're doing some work now studying the, uh, uh, for your new book, I think, uh, studying the uh, development and the history of the uh, CIA, OSS, Nazis and neo-Nazis, is that correct? Yes, in a way. It, what I'm doing is two things. I am teaching a course at the University of Hamburg entitled The CIA, the Cold War, and Right-Wing Extremism. And the content of those lectures and that course and sources and so forth, they are, uh, are going to be a book. So that the lectures will be chapters of a book. And um, I'm, I don't know when I'll have that fi finished. I hope it's, uh, I have it finished next year. But I'm teaching the course in any case uh, as I go along because it's in development. And uh, what I'm trying to do is write a selected history of the Cold War um, in, and show how there is a continuity between the uh, fascist and Nazi movement of the 20s and 30s and 40s, the Mussolini, Hitler, and various other countries, uh, with what's happening in Western Europe and the United States today. Because one of the most phenomenal things that has occurred and hasn't gotten all that much publicity except with Oklahoma City it is beginning to is the growth of the extreme right in Europe and in the United States uh, that is Western Europe and the um, uh, United States and Canada uh, over the last 10 or 15 years uh, it's I, to me it's really alarming and um, uh, it's due in part to the fact that United States policy after the war in Western Europe kept these movements alive 
and they used the Nazis and the SS and the war criminals uh, to continue the war against the Soviet Union. That is, the United States should took over the German war against the Soviet Union and use these people to continue it, but not as open warfare with troops and so forth. It was an underground warfare. It was the Cold War, and the CIA was one of the most important, if not the most important, instruments in the Cold War in carrying on this uh, struggle against the Soviet Union and all of Eastern Europe, its allies. And they um, were uh, carrying on a, a, an undeclared war for 10 years through paramilitary operations. And uh, what happened was, as the Red Army was advancing to the West, the people who had collaborated with the Nazis during the occupation of the Baltic areas of Eastern Europe, of uh, Belarus, of Ukraine, and parts of Russia, where they found fascists everywhere, and they formed SS battalions. And it was really these local people in the Baltics. It wasn't the Nazi uh, SS or Waffen SS so much who, who uh, um, massacred uh, more than a million Jews, but it was the local people who formed, uh, because there were 500,000 non-Germans organized into Waffen SS units. And these were the ones that hunted down all the communists they can find, all the socialists they can find, all the trade unions they can find, and especially all the Jews that they could find. And those huge massacres like Bobby R, those were carried out uh, largely by the, uh, the local people who uh, were fascists before Germany ever invaded. As a matter of fact, the Ukrainians, after the, um, uh, the Bolshevik rev Revolution, they formed an organization of exiles in Paris. So did Russians. Uh, this is the 20s. And these people are cultivated by the Nazis and trained. And there's a, there was a Ukrainian army on the front lines yeah. with the German troops as they, from the OUN as they marched in uh, in 1939, uh, or 41, actually, when they, they crossed the border. But um, these people retreated back with the retreating Nazi troops. And by war's end, you had something like 7 million uh, displaced persons or refugees in these camps all over, mostly in West Germany. And um, the United States then began to recruit and to organize from these camps. And the key figure there was Hitler's chief of intelligence for the Eastern Front, Reinhard Galen. Yeah, yeah. And Galen came from a Prussian family, <laughs> Prussian military tradition. And uh, he had made his life's work of studying the Soviet Union. And in his organization, um, which uh, had the um, German initials FHO, that means uh, Foreign Armies East in German. Uh, he had accumulated the most marvelous records of any country in the world, I mean, by, uh, far and away, uh, on the Soviet Union. And he had been doing this since the 1920s. And he had risen very fast. He was only 43 years old when the war ended. He had a lifetime ahead of him. Wow. And so what does he do? Uh, the last days of the war, he microfilms all the files. He puts a microfilm in steel drums and they load them all on trucks, and with his top people, they drive from their office, their, their headquarters near Berlin, all the way down to the Alps in uh, Bavaria. And they start trudging up, uh, or getting the trucks up there, and then carrying these drums up into uh, a meadow where they buried them. And they walked back, back down the mountains, and they waited for the Clark Army to come through. I think it was Clark. And uh, once they were in occupied territory of the Americans, they um, left their hotel, or wherever they were staying, I think they were in a hotel, and uh, turned themselves in. And Galen, he was a general, he presented himself as a general surrendering to the Americans. And um, he said, I have some inter interesting things to tell you. And he had his, his principal aides, of course, with him and everything. And, and his main um, um, chiefs of sections and all that, they had a plan. They laid low after the war ended to, give, to reorganize later. And so, uh, they took Galen to um, Camp King, which had, um, they, the, the German name was uh, Dulag Luft. And this is where the Germans brought all the downed pilots and crews for interrogation. It was just north of Frankfurt, a, a, a big military compound, a base. Well, um, we took over that. The United States Army took over this base and renamed it Camp King. And there they, uh, it, uh, they debriefed Galen on what he'd been doing, what he had, and he made a proposition. He said, I want to continue my war against the Soviets. Well, the Soviets were after him because he was a war criminal. He was responsible for interrogating uh, or for the interrogations of the millions of um, uh, Soviet prisoners of war 
in the different camps in Germany, and they died by the millions. But the, he was in charge of getting the information out of them that they were capable of giving, and torture, and you know, all that was going on. And so the Soviets were looking for him uh, to try him as a war criminal. They asked the Americans, uh, have you arrested Galen? Do you know anything about him? You can guess the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we don't know a thing. We don't know a thing. So in order to protect him, they flew, flew him to Washington. Uh, he turned himself in in early May of 1945, and by June or July he was in, uh, in Washington at one of the military installations in Washington. Stayed there a year. And the counterintelligence corps, the, this was before the CIA was established, set him up in business back in Germany. And uh, it became known as the ORG, the Galen operation. ORG meaning organization, the Galen organization. And then he started recruiting all these people, uh, including SS, including war criminals, and so forth. And they took over an SS compound in Pulak, a little town just south of uh, Munich. And that's where they started up. And then they off opened offices in different places under commercial cover and so forth. And the CIA took the whole thing over in 47. But the, the Galen was very... He was the key figure in recruiting these people from Eastern Europe to go to the training camps to be trained in military skills as saboteurs and so forth. And then they were sent back into their home countries to foment rebellion, to, to um, retard economic development uh, or recovery after the war, you know, so that there could be this big contrast between Eastern and Western Europe. These things went on for 10 years, and Galen was one of the principal figures. Uh, they, of course, were never able to, um, to really um, uh, take control of any of these countries, but the uh, outbreak of, um, of uh, violence in Berlin in the early years, of early 50s, of um, Poznan in Poland, 53, I think, 56 in Hungary, that did a lot of damage in the East, uh, East Germany, for example. Uh, they were often caught, though, and uh, it happened that uh, one of the big operations in the late 40s and early 50s was to overthrow the government of Albania and restore King Zog as, uh, <laughs> yeah. in power. He was uh, sitting in Egypt uh, waiting to go back to Tirana. And uh, this operation um, was a strange failure because they had all these teams organized and they brought them in uh, in maritime operations on the sea. They brought them overland from Greece. They dropped them in from black overflights, what were known as black overflights. And, um, and uh, one after another after another got rolled up. Sometimes the forces were there waiting for them. And they would, they would uh, double the WT operators. Uh, WT. The WT, the wireless, um, the radio operators. Oh. And uh, they would then give them disinformation to send back. And of course, they were, they were sending under duress. And, and uh -huh. there were suspicions and so forth. Until finally, when Philby defected, uh, uh, that's Kim Philby, the Soviet penetration of the British intelligence service, they knew what had gone wrong because Philby was the British officer on the British side for this Albanian operation. Oh. And so he was telling the Soviets everything in advance, and they telling the Albanians. And, and so um, uh, there, there are several different examples. There's one in uh, Poland also known as uh, WIN, W-I-N, which um, were the Polish initials for the organization. And um, this was supposedly the remnants of the Home Army, the so-called Home Army, that had been under control of the London Poles during the war. Mm -hmm. which the British and the Americans wanted put in power there, and the Soviets refused, and that was one of the major factors that opened up the Cold War. But um, for years, they were dropping in gold bars, gold coins, weapons of all sorts, and ammunition and stuff, and till finally one day, on Polish national radio, they came on the air and exposed the whole thing. And the way it all started was that they had sent this general to London to say what his forces were back in Poland, and they bought and then they organized all this stuff through this general who was really working for the Poles oh, from the start. Wow. So there are lots of these cases, and these paramilitary operations were finally ended. Um, they were responsible for, the, uh, for fomenting the uprisings in East Germany in the early 1950s, in the Poznan uh, uh, uprising in Poland, and then the Hungarian uprising in 1956. But they, uh, the, the uh, radio broadcast to these people had been ambiguous. Uh, by that time, you know, 1950 on, <clears throat> they had one uh, radio operation going to all the different languages of the Soviet Union, and they had, that was radio, first radio liberation. But then they changed it because they weren't going to liberate anybody. <laughs> so they changed it to Radio Liberty. And then there was Radio Free Europe, yeah. which broadcast in the languages of the other Eastern European countries. Both were based in Munich, and both were hot houses for war criminals 
from those countries because not only did these uh, these Nazi collaborators from the various countries of Eastern Europe come back and then uh, let themselves be formed into paramilitary gangs to go back but also they flocked to these radio stations because they had the languages and they had the pol political background and so forth so you had all these uh, fascist uh, war criminals uh, in the CIA fu uh, funded radio stations uh, they were not known as CIA funded at the time supposedly they were private donations from the United States and so forth but anyway um, those paramilitary operations ended after the Hungarian revolt of 1956 there was a special investigation under Eisenhower and they, they called him off but the propaganda and the political operations uh, continued so in this uh, book I'm writing and in the course I'm teaching I'm trying to show how these um, efforts to to uh, continue the war against the Soviet Union using the Nazis and fascists and so forth and the war criminals how uh, these provided a continuity for the survival of these movements which is today so manifest in Eastern Europe or, and Western Europe and in the United States although it's a different situation over here because there's very large religious content to the extreme right movement here and in between to show how uh, fascist or fascist style governments were installed in so many places around the third world um, and of course it starts in the Philippines and goes to Vietnam and continues through the whole American war in Vietnam and uh, all over Latin America and uh, even in Africa uh, in Korea for example with the partition of Korea in 1945 uh, I'm trying to show how there was no real democratic principle behind this policy it was pragmatic and without principle really it was simply to make sure that these governments were on our side against the Soviets and that they allowed our companies to come in and operate and, and so forth and so on. But uh, there are so many fascinating areas. Um, Greece, for example, is one of the more fascinating places because there was a very big resistance in Greece to the Nazi occupation yeah. from about 1941 on. And um, the main resistance forces were, uh, there was a coalition and the principal or the strongest in the coalition were the communists in Greece and the Nazis formed what they called security battalions made of Greeks and these were military units and uh, they were their job was to eliminate the resistance and so it was Greek on Greek fighting all through those years and then at the end of the war the British invaded Greece because the uh, liberation forces the Greek uh, resistance forces they took over the whole country they set up an entire administration in all of Greece and the British invaded it to put them down just like the French invaded in Vietnam to put down the the uh, liberation forces there and um, uh, then they set up um, uh, a provisional government they brought the king back and so forth and then the Greek Civil War started because of all the repression against the the um, liberation forces this this Civil War goes on from 47 to 49 and after it's over the CIA establishes a national Greek intelligence service known by the initials KYP that's the Greek letters for CIA. They give the same name. <laughs> and um, this was formed with the officers from the old security battalions, the, the fascists, uh, hunters of the liberation forces. And uh, these are the same men who, in 1967, uh, overthrew the democratic government and established a seven-year reign of military dictatorship with the, the institutionalization of torture, forced exile of thousands of Greeks, and so forth. Um, Italy, another very interesting interesting case where even as the United States and Britain were the occupying powers in Italy after the war they allowed the Mussolini fascists to establish a new fascist party which and it was fascism was illegal it was outlawed after the war but still Giorgio Almirante for example who had been um, Mussolini's last minister of propaganda in the so-called Salo Republic which is a puppet uh, public pub puppet government um, run by the Germans in the north of Italy in the last months of the war he established the Italian social movement or MSI in 1946 right under the noses and with the approval or acceptance by the United States and Britain they could have stopped it but that party uh, uh, survived through the years and grew and grew and grew until it came into government last year and this is a party which dates from the Mussolini party I mean it's, it's a direct descendant and it's, it's run now by Fini, Gianfranco Fini. And uh, they are a neo-fascist party. Uh, they, in coalition with the Berlusconi, uh, Forza Italia, and the Northern League,
the three parties came to power last March. And a day or two, or two after the elections, um, uh, Feeney, the leader of the neo-fascists, now in power, says Mussolini was the most outstanding statesman of the century. So you see that there is a continuity there, and it's thanks in large part to U.S. policies, because we were the dominant factor, even though the British were involved as junior partners, the French as junior partners, and so forth. And uh, it's, it's just fascinating to see how these uh, movements developed, and the, the, um, uh, the inspiration for the neo-Nazi movement in Germany in the 1990s are these old Nazi war criminals, like Otto Rehmer and uh, Christophson, and there are a lot of names of former SS people, war criminals, who either were never punished or were punished with a slap on the wrist, and who never changed their views. They are unrepentant old Nazis who are the inspiration to the younger generation today. And these are the people who, in conjunction with the skinheads, are firebombing the homes of Turks, of their cultural clubs, and, and killing, killing dozens of people. Uh, so it's a, it's a really uh, kind of complex but quite fascinating scene. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm so interested in doing a book on it. In fact, it's, it's, it's well along. Is your book going to include the uh, bringing over into the United States a lot of these fascist Nazi immigrants oh, yes. and, and setting up organizations in conjunction with the uh, Republican Party? Oh, yes. In fact, I didn't mention, but the, um, the uh, overthrow of the elected Bulgarian government in 1990 was carried out on behalf of the Wayrick organization. I mentioned the Free Congress Foundation. That was carried out or uh, led by Laszlo Pastor. And Laszlo Pastor is a Hungarian. Oh, who was uh, a youth leader in the most uh, fanatical of the Hungarian Nazi organizations. It was called the Arrow Cross. And he was a convicted war criminal. He had to, he was, I think, sentenced to two years after the war. It was, a, it was a, hardly a sentence uh, because he was uh, responsible for rounding up, uh, t he was involved in the rounding up of tens of thousands of Jews to send to the extermination camps. Uh, this is during the 40s before the end of the war while, while, while Hungary still had this Nazi regime under um, Admiral Horthy. Uh, but now the Horthy regime has been rehabilitated in Hungary. But Pastor is the man who was um, one of the major leaders of the Republican ethnic um, yeah. electoral organizations. And they went into the communities um, where there were people from Eastern Europe and their clubs and so forth, you know, in the Middle West and here and there. And uh, this, uh, this ethnic... Um, Nationalities organization, the Republican Party, was, was um, chock-a-block with fascists and, and Nazis from that period in Eastern Europe. They brought them over here. But they brought them over here for different reasons. Uh, the Apollo moon landing was engineered and organized and made possible through Nazi war criminals like Werner von Braun. Uh, these people who came over and ran the Apollo program, in fact, ran the whole United States rocket program from 45 on, had run the um, the underground factory for the V-2 rockets. And there was a, it was in an old salt mine, which had been dug out much larger. And there they created this underground factory that was invulnerable to bombing. And alongside it, they established a work camp called Dora. It was a concentration camp. And um, over a period of about two years, I think the figure is about 35 or 40,000 people who died as slave laborers uh, to make the factory and then to be the workers in the factory. And um, uh, these men were responsible for that. And they were brought by the United States over uh, to, this, to this country and put in the same work here. Um, and uh, Arthur Rudolph, for example, was one of the principals, along with von Braun, and uh, they eventually deported him back to Germany. And he, he had, they'd all become U.S. citizens. Uh, several died, von Braun died, but Rudolf lived on slightly long enough to be, to be deported. And he renounced his U.S. citizenship in the U.S. Consulate General in Hamburg, uh, where I live. So you had them coming back. You had Project Paperclip, for example. Uh, there was a mad rush for the German technology because it was so, far, so much further advanced than the United States or Britain. Paperclip was the code name for bringing Code name was for, the for yes, they had these teams of army people who knew just where they were going to go and they knew who to look for and they'd made this study all through the war. And so they had targets here, there, and everywhere. And they were rushing to get these people before the Soviets got them. 
And so it was a mad scene at the end of the war and the months afterwards because they were grabbing these people and bringing them back as fast as they can could. And they didn't care whether they were war criminals or whatever they did. Uh, they gave them new names in certain cases, were the worst cases, and they protected them. They, they violated, violated U.S. law right and left bringing these people back. But that was, that was the day. I mean, that was the scene then. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it's no different from today. Who, who, who follows the law today in these things? Uh, yeah. And so that is why it's so important for people to be involved uh, in groups, the group of choice. And there are many activities out there to be engaged in, such as solidarity with Cuba to try to break down that blockade of 35 years, or with Guatemala. So uh, there is something out there for everyone, and um, uh, we only have ourselves to blame if we don't take action now, because with the huge growth of the extreme right in the United States, now with the militia movement and the Christian patriot movement, the whole para uh, paramilitary culture, these are the potential brown shirts of the future, in my opinion. And the same exists in Europe where the electoral parties are doing very well in France and in Austria and in Italy and in uh, Belgium and in Norway. But uh, here in the United States, there these extremist parties are not, but the Christian right, which is extremist in my opinion, and they want to impose their own concept of morality on all the rest of us through civil law and so forth, you know, you right. know that. Uh, they have taken uh, over the control of the state Republican Party apparatus in um, between 20 and 30 states. And they are determined, they've, they've said it just straight up front, we are going to take control of the Republican Party by the year 2000. This is Pat Robertson's group. Mm -hmm. But there are many others who are even worse than that. Uh, the country is peppered with these extreme, extremist organizations, and all they're lacking, really, is a charismatic leader. And there's one out there, I'm sure. So we'll only have ourselves to blame if one day there's a knock on the door and they're coming for us, because we didn't take the opportunity when it was there to make sure they never could do that. And that brings us to the end of this Alternative Views. Frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications which we use on Alternative Views and also a reading list for U.S. power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these, send a stamped self-addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network. P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. You must send a self-addressed stamped envelope. We would like to acknowledge the assistance of the people that helped us make our program possible. Jamie Otis is making a documentary about the CIA. This film features uh, Phil Agee in it. And uh, Jamie's the one who was the facilitator for getting us our interview with Phil A.G. The Texas Student Television Group provided the facilities and the crew. We really appreciate the help of our director, Steve Kahn. He was assisted by his technical director, Marty Harris. The camera people were Tony Rumer, Sabrina Tubio, and Tommy Kaiser. We also appreciate the help of Don Cooper, who was the escort for Philip A.G. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. So that's our address if you'd like to write to us. Goodbye. <laughs>